There's two things I wanted to say before starting. The first one is um, that I'm not a nano specialist, so I'm here to learn, and I already learned a lot. And I think at IFPRI, we haven't done much work in this area, so that's also reason for doing this seminar. So I don't claim to be any kind of expert. And the second one uh, is that I didn't know about your presentation beforehand, so I don't have specific comments to relate it to your presentation. Uh, these are general thoughts I had about this particular issue as uh, food policy researchers. Well, to me, nanoscale sciences, we shouldn't talk about technology, nanotechnologies, but nanotechnology. Well, it seems that there are lots of applications. It's evolving. It's changing. There are many products already on the market. Um, I heard about them also when I was at a workshop last year uh, on nanotechnology and development in Brazil. But many more yet are to come. Um, so it really is, as we've seen, something that will move and be, be much broader. There are large investments, we have seen that, also in a number of developing countries, probably mostly in Asia and South America, but I don't have the numbers, but from what we heard already, India, China, Brazil, the big player, Thailand, and a few others. Um, this, there are many application agriculture, we already heard about some of the potential, you know, and these are probably more, the one you present, the more fundamental, you know, research on getting to detection, et cetera. To me, I'm very categorized, uh, those applications I could see, which are on the productivity input side, improvement, including releasing uh, pesticide, uh, detection sensor of, you know, uh, increased uh, potential output for the input. However, my question on that is that it seems that lots of applications that have been developed um, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but they seem to be related to precision agriculture, which would fit very well in the developed country setting, but perhaps a little you know, more difficult to apply in a developing country setting where we're not at, uh, at the, the stage of satellite farming and deciding exactly which, you know, which uh, acre we're going to put fertilizer on. Um, on the quality of agricultural products, that's for sure that there is already a lot of things and a lot more coming on you know, increasing safety, post-harvest, processing, etc., Back to the consumer, uh, when I was in Brazil as a researcher at Ambrapa, which is the big organization there, uh, presented, I think it was um, a nano filter in, uh, in, uh, in a solution. So it was a solution, you would just put uh, fruit into it and then it would just get rid of all the bacterial or microorganism uh, that could affect this apple or any kind of fruits. And he said, you know, it's very applicable. Once you have the solution, you just put it in and so it's very easy to apply and it's, it could in, in improve the safety post-harvest. And then there are enhanced properties of direct products. I won't talk too much about that and many other in environmental clean. The second uh, thing I wanted to talk about is obviously there are also issues. Um, there are opportunities and issues. Um, the first one is perhaps something you didn't mention. Um, and that's the one already uh, I, I had to talk about in, uh, in the workshop I mentioned that was organized by the Meridian Institute in Brazil uh, about potential economic risk. And in this setting, we were looking at uh, whether nanotechnology applications uh, could be complement or substitutes for commodity-based products. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, people say you could do much more with much less. Well, but the question is much less. Okay, so if you really can do with much less, is that a problem for those that already produce this particular input? Uh, so we had discussion about um, nanotextile, um, including those that are already out there, you know, the one that waterproofs, uh, easier to, sell, to, to wash, etc. Versus cotton. In fact, you could use nano, nano applications to uh, improve the, the, the properties of cotton. But then some people in this workshop said that it could also become a substitute because it will encourage the use of synthetic fibers. And that for agriculture would be a big issue if it actually reduced the demand, reduce the demand uh, in the future for cotton because you have millions of farmers involved in cotton farming today. So it's just more trying to anticipate is that a risk or not? So it's a question mark. And the other thing uh, we also, or I heard, also heard about nanomaterial, uh, nanocomposite rubber that could potentially replace natural rubber, and that could have been a problem for the rubber industry. There might be other examples, but you know, this is one consideration. The other ones we already heard about, and a potential risk. Um, I am not a specialist on that, but the big question is what regulation, not only in developed country but going to developing countries. Um, the IPR issues, um, well. Um, from what I heard, one of the main issues that could come to the forefront is the fact that uh, maybe uh, some, some particular actors in, in the field, including perhaps U.S. university, but also big companies like IBM, have, um, have acquired some very broad patents that seem to, could be potentially uh, a barrier to innovation. I don't know if it's true, so I'm asking the specialist if you can say anything about that. Is that uh, 
something you could see as a problem for new innovation in the public sector in the future for developing countries, for instance. And then we have, uh, there's been some ethical issues coming up to the forefront, perhaps it's already too early to talk about that, particularly on convergence and synthetic biology. Um, but this could come back to the debate, I'm sure. So to end my little presentation, I just wanted to say this is what I can take as a policy analyst on, on these issues. I think, you know, I don't know anything, and I think um, I didn't know anything until recently about nano. I think as we heard um, Dr. Rocco uh, say, you know, we need more information exchange between uh, scientists and policy specialists. Obviously, the scientists probably already work on many different applications, and we in the agriculture policy research uh, may, might not know that much. Uh, I don't know how much the CGIAR is actually looking at um, nano applications, and perhaps it's a good time to get into that. And, you know, exchange information is the first step. The second step is, um, is it still time to direct public research? You know, because uh, um, we want also to get to technology that uh, could have a high impact on the poor and, and for agricultural development. And perhaps some technology already will have some uh, impact. But also, you know, you have a lot of capitals that are into technology that gets to certain countries and not the poorest of the poor. So the question is, can we actually, as researcher, contribute to that uh, by, I don't know, uh, priority setting exercises, et cetera, trying to figure out you know, which investment could also help uh, those that, that are in need uh, in agriculture. And the third one is obviously about risk. Again, um, we work a lot at IFPRI on biosafety. Um, you know, it's much biotech, agriculture biotech is much narrower field, so it's, it's nothing to see with the nano science uh, applications. But um, since people are already talking about uh, risk for health, environment, uh, um, as, as the, the former speakers have said, I think it's a good time to really try to put together uh, some governance, you know, some, um, some agreements on risks, because on biotech, what you can see is now there are different countries with different positions, and it's, it's becoming really difficult to talk about the same basis. So it might be a good time to talk about that. Thank you.